background behind Andy. He was telling me just earlier his whole entire background and he is highly versed in all of this. So I'm excited to learn from him. He got his horticulture degree from UNL and since then has continued learning about landscaping and water management and all things like that amidst having two children um, and a partner alongside him. Um, he also went on, he's been working with Omaha Stormwater Management Department since 2011. He started on as an intern and has moved up and must love it so much that he's stuck with it for just about 10 years. So that's awesome. <laughs> um, again, thanks for being here, you guys. Just a full disclosure, you are muted and we can't see you. So if you're eating or whatever it may be, don't worry, you are not seen right now or heard. Um, all right, if you have any questions, we're gonna take one break halfway in between his lecture so that anyone can ask questions. Feel free to post it in the chat or in the Q&A and we'll address those midterm. Make sure that we finish up just before four o'clock. So lastly, again, thank you guys and welcome Andy Zacco. Awesome. Thank you, Dakota. Appreciate it and glad to see everyone here. Um, as, as we go through, definitely post questions uh, as we go along. Uh, I have lots of pictures and lots of information, but if there's particular areas that maybe aren't clear or maybe you want to learn a little bit more about, definitely don't be afraid to ask those questions um, uh, into the, the chat so that we can talk about what you guys want to talk about. Um, with that, um, you know, Dakota got my background uh, pretty well and excited to be here at this Omaha Stormwater Program. We have a great team here. A lot of people um, doing the things like you see here in this picture, helping promote um, landscapes that help soak up water versus letting it run off. So we're gonna learn all about that stuff here quickly today. Um, and with that, let's kick it off. I uh, already mentioned our team here, the people I work with uh, make the job a lot of fun and really interesting. And we, we do a lot of things here above and beyond just sustainable landscapes. Um, so the Omaha Stormwater Program is under is a city of Omaha program and we have a permit with the state and we do these eight different program areas. So the reason I get to do things like this is um, education outreach. So we want to make sure we educate people on what's required, what's not, what works and what doesn't work. And if there's issues with stormwater pollution, you can reach out to us and we can help get that uh, figured out. We also engage people, the public, uh, illicit discharges is a fancy way of saying somebody who's dumping pollution in the water. We go out and investigate that, and check things out. Uh, construction sites with their silt fences around it. Uh, we help make sure construction sites stay clean. Um, Post-construction runoff means uh, when a new development goes in and they have new parking lots and new buildings, trying to manage that runoff as best as we can so that isn't a source of pollution. Industrial stormwater is about industrial sites and making sure those sites are clean. Good housekeeping is us making sure we, as a city, are staying clean, just like we're asking everybody else to. And then we do a lot of monitoring to see what works and what doesn't work with rain gardens, um, green roofs, fire retention, permeable pavement, a lot of different things that we'll be talking about today. So if you want to know more, go to omahastormwater.org. Definitely can learn more there about all those different program areas. So for today, we're just going to kind of set the stage, make sure everyone's on the same page for what we're talking about in terms of sustainable landscapes. Kind of my angles and the stormwater program is, is definitely water focused, but we're gonna get on and talking about sustainable just in general. <clears throat> we'll look at specific things you can do uh, with green infrastructure at home and how to manage water that's on your property, make it a resource and not a uh, waste product. Go through some resources that you can uh, grab and run with after this particular after this webinar to help you out, and then we'll have the Q and A going. So similar to the picture that I got on this virtual background, um, here's a picture of downtown Omaha, uh, high above Spring Lake Park, and you can see a thunderstorm 
over the downtown area. So my question to you guys, and I, if I could hear you or see your hands raised, I would ask you what is stormwater and try to get some feedback from you guys to see what you think it is. Um, and even with my own cousins, uh, my cousins before COVID, we would have poker games, for example, and talking about what stormwater is or isn't. Um, so it's always kind of fun to get people's interpretations of it. But simply put, an easy way to think of it is precipitation that falls from the sky, that hits the surface and it runs off. And that is stormwater. And to be a little more specific, stormwater runoff. And so we have to manage that runoff in some form or fashion when it lands and it goes somewhere else. Um, the reason that's the case is parking lots, buildings, sidewalks, driveways, don't let rain or snow melt or hail or sleet soak into the ground like it did before we developed the, uh, the land. Now, June 2008 was a pretty cool storm that came through Omaha. Um, little tip about my interest and my background is I love the weather. And so uh, I keep track of weather quite a bit. And this one is uh, dear to my heart as well because my daughter was born on this particular storm event. So uh, remember it fondly. It was about an inch of rain and about half an hour, 80 to 90 mile per hour winds. And then the site is completely surrounded by impervious surfaces. And the reason like, stormwater can be a really tough thing to keep, keep a handle on because it, water accumulates quickly. So um, the area around this all ran off into this one manhole. And this one manhole takes almost two acres worth of surface, uh, impervious surfaces. On that one inch rain, that's about 42,000 gallons of water. So imagine your milk jug, imagine 42,000 of those being poured into that one hole at one time. And in that particular case, it flooded the parking lot. So stormwater is a, is a big thing to manage. We need lots of infrastructure. We need lots of tools in the toolbox. And so um, the reason we need lots of tools in the toolbox is every site's different and unique. And we also have lots of different problems with stormwater runoff, which sometimes we have too much of it. We have the Missouri River floods from 2011 and uh, last year as well. Um, we have water pollution issues where, you know, intentionally or not, sometimes paint, you know, comes out of a trash can when it rains and spills out into the street. And then when we have all that runoff, like in that picture we just showed, it's like a fire hose shooting into the streams and creeks. So you can see a pipe that used to be uh, in the embankment of a stream out on the West Papio. Well, everyone puts their fire hoses into the stream and all of a sudden the creek starts to degrade because it's not designed to handle all these different fire hoses shooting into it. So you know, to think of it as a death by a thousand cuts where you know, maybe this one pipe didn't uh, make or break it, but it definitely isn't helping. Um, for those that were here um, on the previous webinar I did a couple months ago, showed this slide as well, but it's a good one where you kind of have your traditional walkout homes um, we got large backyards, and then this particular development is designed to drain uh, from high to low. So you're, the picture on the top left is looking upstream at the homes at the top of the watershed as it flows uh, downstream. And so if you're going out, maybe you're looking to buy a house in this area. You may think none the wiser, right? Big grassy areas, it can't be that much rain coming in there, but lo and behold, um, big thunderstorms that we get often here, you got about a 10 foot river, white capping on the chain link fence, getting about a three, three or four feet close to your foundation. And so uh, there's issues galore in lots of different neighborhoods and trying to manage water as it comes into, through and out of our property is a really important thing. Uh, uh, to, to do and to manage and that's what we're going to do today is learn a little bit more about that. Uh, so we get lots of thunderstorms, right? We, it's feast or famine. Sometimes we get heavy buckets of uh, intense thunderstorms. Sometimes it's slow and drizzly. Uh, this is a graph, a, a graphic I like to use that looks at Epley Airfield's rainfall just on an annual basis. 30 inches is what we're at every year um, on average. For the past six years, one, 
yep, last six years, we've been above average. Below, uh, before that, we had a number of years right at average or maybe slightly below. Uh, but if you take the lowest, driest year in 2012 of 22 and a half inches, and you take the wettest in 2015, you get two thirds of our average annual rainfall, which is a huge swing in when we're talking about plants and landscapes and managing things uh, in that nature. So if we can do stormwater management well here, you know, it's, it's a pretty robust system. We can do it in a lot of different places. So we get through the ringer. A little graphic on the bottom right talks about rainfall events per year. Sometimes we get lots of the big storms and Sometimes we get a lot of the fewer ones, and you can see just the difference between 18 and 19, uh, how many more events there were in 18 than there were, was in 19. 19 had a total more rainfall. So you know the events were probably a little bit heavier because there weren't as many of them. Um, this year is a really interesting year. It's currently we're at 13.6 inches at Epley Airfield. It's really, really dry. Uh, at this point in the year, we're over 12 inches below average. So feast or famine, right? Um, and of those different rain events too, something to keep in mind is even though we do get those big ones, they don't make up a lot of those total rain events that we get. Most of the time we're looking at an inch or less. So this orange slice is an inch or greater. Everything else is less than an inch of rain. And as we move forward sustainable landscapes, green infrastructure, I'll kind of use those two terms interchangeably. Uh, can, are really good at managing those smaller events. They're not really, they only have so much size, right? You only fit so much water in a rain barrel or a rain garden. And so um, the stuff we're going to be talking about does a really good job of managing the lion's share of rain events. So moving on from that, some of the common things that as a landscape professional and then coming and work with the city, there's a lot of perceptions out there, and there's some very common ones when we're talking about sustainability, uh, green infrastructure, stormwater management. People like to use the word control. They like to control water and get it away as fast as possible. Um, people also like natural landscapes, right? You go on vacation to the mountains, you go on a hike to the forest. We love natural landscapes, but when it comes to our landscape, we like the natural look, but we want it neat and tidy. You know, We don't want too much nature. And then also, uh, we'll be talking about some native native and adaptive plants. And there's a perception that native plants means there's no maintenance. You can just put it in there and forget about it. Um, well, that's these perceptions are not the case. You know, instead of saying control, always think of it as managing water. We want to slow sink and spread water where it lands. If we can do that, then it doesn't go into that storm sewer pipe and create the fire hose into the creek. And it lets the plants uh, use it. We can recharge groundwater. So always think about managing water with the three S's, slow sink and spread. Um, now, sustainable landscaping can be formal and it can be informal. It can be whatever you want it to be. Um, so I want to kind of dispel that myth quite right off the bat because I can have a really nice and tidy landscape, but use a lot of really interesting native plants that are beneficial, um, provide ecosystem services, provide food for uh, insects and animals. And then at, in, in the end, we live in an urban area, at least most of us do, I'm assuming. And when we live in urban areas, we are not in a natural environment. So even though we may have native plants, which are great and they grow well here, we got pressures from around us that maybe isn't as natural. You know, we got dandelions growing, you know, bindweed, maybe got some other um, things going on that can impact you. So your landscape is always going to need maintenance to be what it needs to because there's so many pressures coming onto it. All right. So what is a sustainable landscape? Um, for those that read the description for the presentation, everything, you may be asking yourself that. You may have your own uh, thought on what it is. But just so we're all kind of um, talking, uh, kind of apples to apples here, we're gonna assume a sustainable landscape is something that nurtures and preserves, preserves itself over time. It doesn't require a lot of additional amounts of water, chemicals, uh, fertilizers, pesticides. So it's a real simple way to say, let's uh, 
doesn't need a lot of input, so we don't put down the chemicals. It manages water, looks pretty, uh, and is an ecosystem uh, provider for insects and the uh, ecosystem around it. So I mentioned I kind of use these terms a little interchangeably. I will always kind of default to green infrastructure since that's the, the career I'm in, that's the, the realm I'm in. I'm really kind of focused on stormwater, which is we use this term quite a bit to talk about the preservation, connecting and mimicking of natural processes so we can manage rain where it lands. The green infrastructure can easily be used in terms of sustainability with a lot of different aspects of sustainability. But here for today, we're going to kind of hone in the notion that green infrastructure is all about uh, what we have here. Notion of, notion of preservation is to say, don't mess it up in the first place. It's one of the best things you can do, right? And if we have fragmented green infrastructure practices around, they don't work as well together unless they're connected. So um, that's why we want to say connecting. Mimicking. So we're going to talk about a little bit of permeable pavement and rain barrels today. Well, those aren't natural. Uh, but they mimic water actually landing on the ground and going into the ground. So a rain barrel mimics it because it holds that water for a little bit so we can put it on our plants and our landscape as opposed to going down the driveway. All right. I think we're doing pretty good. Moving on to green infrastructure, the benefits, right? That's kind of what we're here today is to learn about the benefits and why you're going to want to do this. There's lots of reasons why, but we can break it down into a few simple things in that can habitat, our bees, our pollinators, um, birds, you name it, need plants, need diversity. Uh, they don't necessarily need concrete or roofs. So we want to make sure we're incorporating habitat so that we have a happy environment around us. Uh, it looks good. <laughs> Simply put, green infrastructure looks good. People like to be near uh, green. They like to be near plants in the landscape. Uh, green infrastructure also provides uh, clean water and helps us clean up water as well. And then happy people. Um, this is a picture of an Omaha green infrastructure tour a couple of years ago where uh, we take people around and go look at stuff and it never surprises me at the response we get where we had for a number of years two charter buses full of people we would take around Omaha and um, enjoy green infrastructure in town. So bringing it back down, not back down, bringing it down to our home landscapes. That's why we're here today to kind of learn about what we can do at our homes. And when I talk about green infrastructure, uh, we're talking about things like you see here, rain gardens, bio swales, rain barrels, uh, you can read the rest. Um, there's lots of different things that you may even not know are green infrastructure like trees. Trees, as you see in these pictures, hold a lot of water in its canopy. And not only that, but it slows water down as it's falling and doesn't cause as much erosion either. Uh, so think of a tree as a little mini lift station. It puts its roots down, pulls up water, and, you know, evaporate, you know, evapor it breathes, it uses that water, um, and helps really manage stormwater well on a given property. And by the way, this is my front yard as well. Dakota and I were talking before the webinar about, you know, whether or not my yard was really, you know, the best yard, the most sustainable yard. Um, but my commentary was, well, landscapers yards is, is always the last yard to get done. So, but here I like to have fun with water. So uh, my neighbor has her downspout shooting right, uh, right towards my property. Well, I ended up rebuilding my retaining wall with this little low spot. And I'm not quite sure if you can see my cursor um, on the screen. Um, if not, you can, okay, good. Um, you can see a low spot in the wall that actually uh, I let the water come over into this little cascading uh, mini rain garden and then it overflows that into another little mini rain garden and this rain garden is getting bigger and bigger as I have time. So you can see a little bit of my yard here and some different easy ways to incorporate stormwater management and green infrastructure. Now where to start? at your home, it's the best thing you can do is improve your soil, okay? Uh, too often we, we kind of 
want to get going and go buy all the plants and stick them in the ground. Uh, for those that have newer homes, odds are your soil is probably not the greatest because to build a home, you have to have equipment driving around, compacting the soils, ruining the structure of it, and who knows what's left over. So improving your soil is going to help not only those turf areas, but your sustainable landscape beds as well. So start there first. You can do an easy soil test um, and take it to the extension office. You can do it to a couple other companies here in town where they can tell you put X, Y, and Z into your uh, soil so that you can get plants to grow there. So that's the first thing. Second thing is you know, compost is a wonderful thing. Uh, it's a, uh, it adds organic matter, it adds structure to soil, and it gets it up and running. Uh, what you're seeing here is a workshop we did with some homeowners. This was back in my grad school days. And we got uh, everyone together and we're working in compost into a fairly clay soil, not the best of soils, and uh, working it in, and it's helping to build the soil back. Um, we, I use the term soil conditioning as a term because we can't restore soil. Nature's going to do that over time uh, through adding organic matter, having plants there, having worms, uh, beneficial fungi in the soil. So I, I can't create soil, but I can definitely set the stage for it to, to come back. So compost is a great, wonderful thing to do. Um, don't put too much into it. If you got a, a really good soil, you may not even need any compost, but if you got a poor soil, one to two inches tilled into the top six inches is, is a great idea. Um, once you're all said and done tilling in the compost, uh, you can take a break, sit down, Look at the darker soils there instead of the light tan <laughs> soils as well. Um, so we uh, got all the compost worked in there. And if you want to learn a little bit more uh, soil conditioning, it, we have a, a simple fact sheet on omahastormwater.org. You can go take a look at, I've sprinkled in these resources uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, so if you have something you're interested in, uh, definitely go take a look at it and learn a little bit more about it. All right, so we started with our soil. Uh, from there, let's go collect some rain for a dry day, right? So let's get this rain barrel, which you may or may not have noticed right off the bat, but once you realize this downspout is coming in through the top of it, lo and behold, oh, okay. The rain barrels come in so many different shapes and sizes. Um, and what you may not realize is this, uh, we'll call it a manhole cover right here, adjacent to the sidewalk for this homeowner is actually a 2,000 gallon cistern tank. And we, this was back in contractor days. And so there's a 2,000 gallon cistern uh, septic tank underneath there. We put some valves on it. There's a pump inside the garage that um, allows this water to get pumped out. And this water that's collected in the cistern harvests water from other downspouts, not this one collects it, and then we pump that water out to irrigate about 2,000 square feet of landscape beds around the property. Uh, Sharon, whose home this is, is a uh, wonderful lady, wanted to do everything sustainable she could at her house. And so this is our two examples, a rain barrel and the rain cistern that we did uh, to, again, make it a little bit more sustainable there. Um, at omahastormwater.org, we have a brochure, and the brochure is generic in nature, and it tells you how to build your own rain barrel. And we did a, a live video for Earth Day Omaha as well, which was great. Uh, in person is always better, but go there, check it out. You can use a lot of different materials, but this is a step-by-step -step for how to build a rain barrel. Um, if you do build your own, have some, have some fun. If you buy one, like this terracotta one, um, have some fun with it. You know, rain chains are a pretty neat uh, ornamental thing you can do at your home where the chain will lead the water into the top of the, the rain barrel. You know, art is always a fun thing to do. Paint your rain barrel, uh, put some nice graphics on it, hide it so that the uh, neighborhood doesn't, you know, hound you for having a, a tank outside or something. There's, you know, covenants out there as well, but have some fun with it, repurpose old things and, and um, the the nitty gritty of it though for everyone to take home is with the rain barrel 
it's really simple. You got to get water in. So you cut a hole in a barrel. And these are pond supplies you can get at any big box store. I was at Lowe's and Menards at Home Depot here recently and did see that these things exist at those places. And so you get these baskets and bags so that the basket can sit in the top of the lid. The downspout comes down into it. Now you can keep the leaves and sticks and debris out. Now you want to get the water out, so you put the spigot at the bottom. You buy just a spigot at the big box stores, drill a hole, and you can screw it in. And then over here on the right is uh, when the barrel fills up, which it will, um, 1,000 square feet of roof. On one inch of rain, you're going to get about 600 gallons of water. We get 30 inches a year. So if you have a roof of any size, you're going to get a ton of water that's not going to fit in this barrel. So you want to have an overflow. So make sure you have an overflow and you can put a pipe on the end of this and take it wherever you need to do. You do lose some capacity at the top, but you got to have that because you don't want water coming out of the top and going somewhere where you don't want it to. And I thought I'd share um, at that Dundee Elementary School on the title slide, um, this is a picture of a 500 gallon rain silo or a 500 gallon rain barrel, whatever you want to call it. This one was sold as a silo. Uh, so it's really neat. Uh, the school uh, can use it to irrigate their uh, outdoor classroom there as well. So it comes in lots of different shapes and sizes, but the concept is the same. Water in, water out. And when this thing's full, it actually goes straight down the pipe on down into the landscape over there. All right, so we collected rain for a dry day, and now we're collecting some rain for wet days, right? So here's the rain garden. Here's an example of a neighborhood called Saddle Hills over off 78th and Fort Street. Uh, we did, uh, we got some grant funds and worked with homeowners over there to pull runoff from the street into their, uh, into their yards. And so that's what you're seeing here. Um, you really, to do this, I show this with a, with, a, with a word of caution. To take runoff from the street means you really have to know what you're doing and design it appropriately because there's a lot of runoff that comes down the street. And I'll show you here in a second. Um, but all that's to say is uh, rain gardens come in lots of different sizes, shapes, and colors, and textures. And this one, this area helps capture grit, sand, debris, coming off the street so you can clean up easily without it getting into the rain garden as well. So a rain garden is simply a shallow depression that uses native and adaptive plants uh, to absorb and filter stormwater. And it's also designed to drain within 24 hours because it is not a bog, a wetland, a mosquito breeding ground. Um, when that water is draining and leaving within 24 hours, you avoid mosquito issue problems. So this is another one of the rain gardens in the neighborhood as well. And I'm not sure if I'm lagging here. Let's press play. Technology is great, right? Um, in lieu of actually seeing the flow come in here, you can see that half the street's full of water, right? Well, up here, a little ways past this curb inlet. Um, there's the inlet that looks like the one we just saw above this bush. So water's coming in there and the rain garden is full and overflowing through this little rock area right here. Well, there's so much rain coming that we made sure that one, water could leave if it needed to, but two, it could also bypass it and come into the storm sewer where it's designed to handle those really big flows. So we're peeling off what we can, right? Smaller storm events managing it, but then letting everything else go by to be handled with other infrastructure that's available. Yeah, well, too bad. This is a time lapse. Um, kind of the next thing to talk about with rain gardens is how dynamic they are. But like with any landscape, I can show you a lot of pretty pictures. Um, I have a lot of them, but I want to show you a whole growing season from start to finish. So this is uh, UNO's Welcome Center. Now it's known as the Hayden House. And we did a couple uh, demonstration projects. We did a demonstration project with a couple rain gardens there. 
And part of that project, we put some cameras there to uh, observe them year in and year out. And so we've stitched together pictures to show the growing season to see how dynamic it changes and even uh, learn from it in terms of, you know, hey, here's some maintenance shots of the crew going out there. And here's a freezing event and lots of different things. So um, if you're interested in seeing it, definitely reach out to me. I can figure out a way to make sure uh, we get this, the full benefit of seeing stuff like this and, and learning from it. If you want, Andy, we could put it on the, uh, um, the Facebook page. I don't know if we could post those videos on there, but that would be one way to get okay. all that on. That sounds great. Well, it's two thirty-two now. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up, you know, a little bit before three. So um, this is probably a good spot to maybe just take a quick break, uh, see if there's any questions, and then go from there. Yeah. First question is from Stacy Christensen. She's wondering, um, when, back when you were talking about rain barrels, if the video is available for the rain barrel, and if that's on the website. Uh, yes, it's available. Um, it's not on our stormwater website, but um, I'll, go, uh, I'll make sure we get a link of that um, that we can share with everybody who's registered. Awesome. Awesome. Let's see. Well, people are thinking, oh, never mind. Oh, she said thank you. <laughs> 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 well, people are thinking about questions. Um, I'll ask. I'll ask a few. Um, so when you go to construct these different rain gardens, um, obviously, generally, it's at the bottom of a hill, right, of some kind. Does it make a huge difference when it's um, coming from off of concrete? Do you have to make sure you put like different plants depending on, obviously, how much water is going to be there, or even at like the speed of the water that's coming down into these different rain gardens? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and here, uh, must have seen my presentation before I did because I actually, it's a, it's a main thing to keep in mind is that point where water moves from like a driveway into the landscape, that's where things can unravel. Yeah. Soil can erode. So there's definitely certain plants that are really good at um, those kinds of areas. And, you know, plants that are rhizominous or spread as opposed to being a single plant. Single mm. plant water will kind of come and split around it and can eventually erode that. But if you got a plant that has rhizomes, it's going to fill in the area and hold that soil better. Huh. Yeah, mm, lots cool. of good, good little things there and some of the resources we'll touch on will help people get to that point. Cool. Um, Sharon Manhart is asking if there are any local groups or consultants that can help with design ideas for home projects, native, pollinator, sustainable mm -hmm. land typings type things. Yeah, Sharon, that's a great question. It's, if there's nothing else that everybody today takes away is to ask people about water, about rain gardens, and uh, it forces the industry to get better. And it forces people to maybe create a local group. Uh, there are a lot of different groups out there working on different things. Um, I believe, um, you know, even Heartland 2050, for example, is a um, planning, um, it's a it's trying to work together on natural uh, resources and improving that. And so there's lots of people that are part of this Heartland 2050 um, that work together on um, water resources or trails or any number of things that if you want to become more involved with it that's a great place to start um, there's also lots of companies out there that are starting to focus on this um, i don't have anyone to recommend to you uh, i can definitely tell you which contractors we've worked with in the past on projects like you're seeing today um, and definitely reach out to me my contact information is at the beginning and end and so i can definitely talk with you and sharing more information with you at that point Awesome. Um, let's see. Next one, Brittany asked if you can, if you do a container rain garden for a downspout that feeds to cement. Oh yeah, absolutely. There are some uh, uh, folks that I've, I've gotten to know that come up with some really interesting uh, setups where they'll have a container. I believe even the city of Lincoln has something similar to this where 
they have a planter box and the planter box has lots of plants in it. It takes the runoff from the downspout, kind of holds it, stores it, and then extra water has a uh, pipe that goes safely somewhere else downstream. And then over time, those plants will use that water and the water that is stored in there slowly kind of bleeds out over time. So that it has become like a stagnant water area, but it's at a slower rate. Uh, it's a little bit cleaner. Um, and the reason slow is important is because the speed of water is a pollutant in and of itself because it causes so much erosion and damage to streams, creeks, and other people's mm -hmm. property. Good to know. Um, Lori wanted to mention that there are many great groups focused on native plants, including the statewide um, Arboretum at UNL. So that's just one more thing. Thank you, Lori. That's great. Yeah, thank um, you, Lori. Glenn is wondering, um, what about weed laws in some city, the term worthless vegetation is a pretty cool, broad term. Yeah, fortunately, um, I mean, codes and rules and regs can be uh, fairly generic in nature. So uh, in one person's eyes, you may have a beautiful native landscape and somebody else's eyes may have a weed patch. Um, but fortunately, a lot of the folks that at least I have worked with, mm -hmm. um, will work with people to identify what is and isn't um, weeds and vegetation. Um, there's a number of homes that I've seen that have a full landscape and no turf grass, but they're not necessarily violating anything. So um, simply put, uh, it's tough depending on who's enforcing the rules and who's looking at something and, and getting an interpretation. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's nothing intrinsically wrong with having large areas of sedges or uh, little blue stem, for example. Also, uh, there are some more fundamental things like not having too tall of plants at an intersection that blocks your view um, of oncoming traffic. So there's other specifics there that you may get dinged on if your plants are too tall at an intersection, for example. Good question, Glenn. <laughs> Amy Green says that she has a very small area and would like to install a better rain system flat. Should I regrade to create a better catch area? Um, well, I'd, happy to, I'd be happy to uh, maybe talk to you a little bit more in detail, but if you have a very small flat area, uh, you may need to do some regrading to, you know, have water stored in one area and you can walk and occupy a different area without having your feet wet. And so there's probably a lot of things you, you can do. Um, I know that's fairly generic, but uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> get you some yeah. more information. Yeah, it sounds like she, she put a little bit more in. She says, um, another area I have near our mailbox would like to create or incorporate the standing area water to develop a rain catch system in our roadside ditch area which is lower than the road suggestions. Gotcha. Yeah, there's, um, you know, roadside ditches um, or if you're at curb and sidewalks, you got these hell strip areas that have become very uh, unpleasant for plants areas. Uh, definitely do things in that area. Uh, context is really important. So um, if you haven't run off from a road, you need to have something that's done quickly because if you, let's just say, you know, remove whatever's there, you have bare dirt and it rains, all of a sudden you have sediment leaving the site. Don't want that. So lots of different strategies to achieve, um, I think what you're talking about here, but getting the right plants, something with a little bit taller vegetation that can filter water, but still move it through and look nice and maybe you don't have to mow it as often, all feeds into that sustainable aspects that we're talking about today. So I think you definitely have some opportunities there to do some, some pretty neat things there uh, for a catch system along your road. Thanks, Andy. Um, it looks like last one for now. Nancy is wondering, she says, when doing recovery restoration, specifically removing bush honeysuckle from an area, the ground is unprotected and vulnerable for a period of time. What is your best or quickest protection method until it can recover? Um, lots of different options. There's things called erosion blankets. So depending on your context yeah. sometimes they're they look like straw or sometimes people will just put straw out um, some people put their grass clippings down so if you have an area that's not taking concentrated flow 
you can do something like that because you just want to cover the ground so that the raindrops don't dislodge it and cause erosion. If you have area where water's flowing, you've got to do something a little bit more. So, you know, bundles of, uh, those are wattles, are like tubes of straw, and you can use those to help break up flow or large areas. There's other matting, erosion control mats that are made of like coconut fiber that lasts longer and you can plant within it so that over time the plants will grow through that netting um, and then they prevent erosion and then as that blanket degrades over time uh, you kind of trade out those two um, things so that they're working together and you're not letting sediment leave the site. Good to know. Thank you Andy. Yeah. All right, so 242, time flies when we're having fun. I'm going to go kind of quick through these last few slides um, so we can get through it. Um, rain garden designs, um, for those who are interested in doing more with rain gardens, um, like with the rain barrel, you got to get water in and out. Uh, you want to make sure it has a flat bottom. Think of a cup, right? If it's flat, yeah, it holds as much water as it can, but as soon as I start to tip my cup, water is going to pour out and I can't hold as much water. So the same thing is for the rain garden. If we have a flat bottom, we can really maximize how much water is stored in it. Uh, a berm. A berm is simply around it to help hold the water in place, right? So if we have a bowl, uh, think of the berm as the edge of the bowl holding everything in. Definitely want to um, make sure we have good soil like we've talked about before. Uh, mulching uh, a landscape after it's installed helps keep moisture in, keeps weeds down, and the plants, we love our plants, and we gotta make sure those are part of the equation. Uh, configuration of a rain garden is really up to you. Um, really, um, what, you, what fits the space, what looks good. Um, but you also wanna have some rule of thumbs. When you have a rain garden, you kinda wanna, if it's long and skinny, have it set up so it's perpendicular to your water flow as opposed to all your water coming in at one point and maybe causing you some issues. So in your front yard, if you can put the long side facing a downspout, then that water has a bigger area that can slowly cascade into it. It's not essential, but it's uh, generally uh, helps with uh, having as much water get into the rain garden as possible. Um, Aesthetics is a really important thing. So as we kind of go through here, I'll give you some tips and tricks uh, for when you're picking out your plants. The things you're gonna to wanna to ask yourself as you're uh, pulling together your sustainable landscape or your specifically your rain garden is what kind of soil do you have? You have to know what kind of soil you have and how much water can soak in because rain gardens drain in 24 hours. Easy way to figure this out is dig a hole where you're thinking of putting your rain garden. Do a one by one by one. Uh, hole, fill it up with water and let it soak it in the ground. Fill it up again, put a little stick in where the water is and time it for an hour. If it goes down a quarter of an inch, you can get six inches in 24 hours. So a quarter inch times 24 hours gets you six inches that can soak into the ground in 24 hours. So our rain garden should only be maximum six inches. Anything above that won't soak in within 24 hours. Now, where is your water coming from? Is it coming from the driveway or a downspout? The source of water is important for knowing if you need something to kind of capture the sand and, and grit that comes off a street. Off a downspout, not so much. Um, and also, how does water flow through your property? We don't want to put water uh, above or next to buildings, for example. So not every space is well suited for green infrastructure for rain gardens, things of that nature. So make sure you really keep an eye on how your water is flowing through your property. Uh, for the location, keep it 10 feet. These are good rules of thumb. Keep them 10 feet from, the, from a building uh, near where water is already flowing. Uh, you don't have to create huge construction projects where you have to shift where the water is flowing. That's always a little bit easier, right? So flatter areas are easy to work, to put in a rain garden because you don't have as much uh, digging and uh, moving of soil around to make that flat area or that sloped area flat. 
Uh, the sunnier it is, the more plant selection options you have. Um, avoid steep slopes, avoid where water sits. If water sits in your yard, it's because the soil isn't very good or something's there impeding it. So it's probably not going to be a good place to put something that we want to uh, infiltrate water. Uh, if you can avoid under trees, that's a good thing. One, for not hurting the tree roots itself, but also because of the shady conditions really kind of limits your plant selection there. So getting water in, um, here's my home. Here's my downspout and I use chunks of limestone kind of in this fan shape. So I'm trying to spread the water out, right? And then I have rocks that I've planted with uh, sedges in between the rocks as a means to help hold the soil in place in between the rocks. Over here on the right is a park rain garden where we have just a utility box that takes the runoff from the street and gives it uh, an area to settle out. So all, all we have to do is take a square head shovel and scoop the debris out and throw it away, move it to an area to store it. And then the one below is, is another project where we did the same thing. Uh, utility box that helps capture that stuff that comes off the parking lot. You can also just have a grass swale too. Uh, as long as this is sloped towards the rain garden, should be no problem. Grass does a good job of helping holding soil in place overall. Getting water out, sometimes the berm has a low spot in it that's designed to help let the water out and go downstream to the next one, to the next rain garden. Maybe we have river rock because um, we like to have that um, look to our landscape. So that's another thing, armor it with that. The one lower left, once this rain garden fills up, uh, water just physically can't get in here anymore, and so it will go right past it. So that's what I would call an offline system, an offline rain garden. <clears throat> and then over here in this home landscape, you got a little bit of a riser pipe. Uh, the cone grate should be on top of that, but this takes water underneath the sidewalk and out into the yard a little bit further out. So that would be what I would call a riser pipe. So when the water gets to that level, water goes in there and out. Uh, here's flat bottoms is important um, when we have our yard right here. Maybe it's uh, sloped pretty good. You set your stream level and this you want the stream level level because that's how we're going to measure the depth of our rain garden. And I've done three hour workshops on this. So don't worry if I am uh, glazing your eyes over with too much information. But the notion here is uh, when we look at it, we kind of cut that slope out, we use it to build our berm over here to hold the water in place. Now really steep slopes are tough to get plants to grow on. So if you can make it a, a more gentle slope around your garden, that's always a good thing. So your garden may be this, but you may need to go out a little bit further to have those slopes nice and gentle. And then also over here with this sh uh, really sharp slope, may need to put some boulders or maybe a little retaining wall there. All sorts of good options to do. Um, moving on, you got the structure built, overflow, water coming in, we got the plants going in. You wanna make sure you plant it well. Um, keep it simple, fewer plants, it's easier to keep track of. Um, it also looks visually appealing as well. You can always add more to it. So always encourage people to keep a simple uh, landscape plan. Use live plants whenever you can. Um, in this picture, rain is coming here right off the bat. So um, if you have plants that have vegetation that can keep their head above water, that's a good thing. They can, they can deal with that. If we are seeding this area, the seed moves around, uh, could drown if they germinate and they're below water for a while. So in general, use live plants, plugs, quarts, or gallons. Um, and then ultimately nature will kind of decide where the plants want to grow and, and don't want to grow. Uh, it's always fun to see how that shakes out. I uh, would highly encourage um, have a pattern. So if you're not a green thumb but you still want to do a sustainable thing, have three plants, set up a pattern, that way you know what's what. And if the weed starts popping up and you're questioning whether or not it's something you should pull or not, if it doesn't look like the plant that's supposed to be there, you can pull it. So that's a nice, easy trick as well. Uh, the plants are really important because roots um, 
start to go deeper and deeper and they open up channels. So over time, you actually see your rain garden perform better and better. So instead of six inches in 24 hours, you know, 10 years down the road, you may get you know, eight inches per hour, maybe even more than that. You know, it just all depends on your soils. Uh, natives and non-natives. We can have a lot, uh, pretty long conversation about that. Um, a lot of non-natives have relatively shallow roots. Natives have deep roots and natives grow in our area, know our climate. And deep roots are, are a key reason for that because they have a much bigger area now that they can tap when they go through our feast and famine cycles, right? When there's too much water or even when there's not enough, when there's not enough, uh, Prairie drop seed has you know, eight feet of area, give or take, that it can start to pull water from. So uh, native and well-adapted plants provide habitat value for birds, pollinators. <clears throat> um, typically don't need a lot of fertilization, irrigation once they're established. Um, native doesn't necessarily mean a plant grows well in every site or location. You put a, a native plant in an ultra urban area that's highly compacted, it might not grow because it's not the environment it's used to. Uh, NEWANIPS is a fun little acronym nobody knows or uses, but it, it means native, ecologically well-adapted, non-invasive plants, which opens the door for plants that may not be native, but work well here and don't take over the world um, in your particular landscape. I had a little video here of a happy little bee. Uh, a happy little pollinator as well. Took a, a bee flying around some pinspin in the front yard. Um, it's pretty fun to see it working, um, see the animals and insects happy. Since we are at 253, I want to make sure we have some time for some more um, questions and answers. I'm going to go real fast through this. And these slides are meant to kind of show you some different examples of uh, foliage, texture, and color. Uh, making sure you got plants of different seasons. You got asters here, you got the fox sedge, and down the middle is the switchgrass that's gone dormant here uh, in late October. Lots of good stuff. Here's an example of a really simple rain garden where you have switchgrass on the right and you got some Carl Forrester on the left. Simple. Some people like it, some people don't, but the notion here is uh, that's pretty easy to maintain, especially if I send my two kids out to do weeding. And I say, don't pull this, don't pull this, and there's something else you can pull it. <laughs> uh, make sure you get the right height of plants. Uh, Joe Pieweed is really tall. Little Joe is much smaller. It's still tall, uh, but it's a better option. And generally speaking, taller plants tend to be viewed as more weedy. Um, so if you don't get the right plant in the right place, um, your neighbors may not appreciate your sustainable landscape as much as, as you do. So here's a good example of you know shorter plants right next to the sidewalk is really short and you get a little bit taller back from there. Uh, adding some rocks and boulders, have a lot of fun with it. Um, this is a small little rain garden uh, out in West Omaha here, um, kind of as an example of what you can do and when people are walking by here, some people are none the wiser that this is actually a rain garden here as well, managing the runoff. Um, when you're doing this stuff, uh, it's gonna, the worst day is gonna be the first day. So this is September, this is in Florence at a project where we were working on it and it got planted and unfortunately it looks like a grave. Uh, people call it a grave, a death trap, all sorts of things because it just doesn't look, look really good. Worst day is the first day because those plant roots aren't down. But you give it time, you give it some care, it looks really nice. Um, also, don't force it if it doesn't work. Um, know your space. So here's an area where in order to make the elevations work and the amount of storage for water to work, it looks like a crater with a whole bunch of utilities going through there and, and a lot of not good things. So um, not every place can be um, a rain garden, but it could be a sustainable landscape with some nice native plants that look really nice for the community. All landscapes need maintenance, so uh, make sure, this is the video I was gonna show you, but um, I can show you lots of pretty pictures, but I'm also gonna show you what it looks like when it's not pretty and some of the maintenance that goes with it. So you do have to cut plants back. Um, when water's coming in, debris does build up. So um, 
not hiding that at all and make sure that you're aware of it so that you bite off of what you can chew uh, with your landscape. And so to wrap it all up, to truly make all this sustainable, we got to have uh, our kids and everybody else, you know, learn about this stuff. So um, these are some examples of work that we've done that I've worked with Steve Brody and uh, UNO on to engage the next generation and learning more about this and making sure green infrastructure and sustainable landscapes are a tool in the toolbox that's always used. You know, people know how to mow, right? Well, we want people to know how to implement and maintain green infrastructure so that, you know, those that want to mow and go, uh, we get those people that want to, you know, manage flow and go, you know, whatever you want to call it. So doing lots of work with them, a lot of engagement along the way. Um, doing hands-on projects with students and kids, um, really tying them to their, their landscapes is, is what makes this landscape truly sustainable. Omaha Northwest High School uh, did a lot of work. Uh, high school students there, they won an award for this particular project outside their greenhouse. Permeable pavement and two rain gardens and butterfly wings. Um, a lot of creativity. Uh, we've done workshops with, with neighborhoods as well. Um, so with the last couple of minutes, omahastormwater.org, there's two manuals there. One is the Sustainable Landscapes Manual. This one's geared towards the homeowners and we'll cover a lot more about what we talked about today. Um, and then Bioretention Gardens is geared more towards the designer contractor. I definitely encourage you to you know, let your contractor know about it, um, look at it, lots of good things there. Omahaplants.org is a joint venture with us and our planning department in UNO to have a resource for plants that are uh, useful in a lot of different situations for sustainable landscapes. Uh, University Extension has a rain garden design. Uh, they actually have lots of extension publications. This one's a an online one that's virtual that's really great. So Google EC1262 rain gardens. If you do that, you'll find it. Uh, really great stuff. Helps you do site selection, sizing. Has videos, animations, a lot of good stuff there. Whew. All right. That was a flurry right there at the end. Any final questions as we wrap up? Is the PowerPoint going to be available? Yeah, we can make it available for sure. Um, you can only take in so much, right? So we'll, we'll make sure it's available. And those videos, I'm excited to see them. Oh, I see you've got another one. Oh, Stacy said thank you. <laughs> awesome. All right, so if you have more questions or need some resources, again, go to our website. Um, if you got other, uh, information, questions, things of that nature, you can reach me on my email uh, there on the screen. One quick one. John's wondering where you like to purchase your native plants. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of places. Um, I've been out of the commercial landscape uh, industry for a while, um, but I used to work at Earl May growing up. So I can go to Earl May, Lana House, Mole Halls, Indian Creek. Um, there's there's even some wholesale nurseries in town as well, but um, if they don't have it, ask them about it. You know, create that demand. You know, hopefully, encourage some of these uh, nurseries to carry a little bit more. Um, oh, uh, there's a cut. There's one I'm forgetting right now that's a little bit further west of town. That's a really good one as well. But um, again, Google search native plants uh, nurseries. Um, you'll find a lot of them that I've. I'm not even thinking up here at the moment. <laughs> well, Great. thank you so much, Andy. Thank you for all that. That was incredible. I can't wait to start my own rain garden. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Well, hopefully everyone learned something and have a great, great afternoon. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for being here.